We're back with the Breakfast and Plus TV Africa and, uh, of course, uh, zooming to a first major conversation now. Talk of a third alternative force emerging in Nigerian politics and possibly wresting power from the two big political parties in the country. We're talking about the APC and the PDP in the 2023 general elections. It has been rife in recent time as some Nigerians yearn for a different political direction from what has pertained in the country since its return to multi-party democracy in 1999. But what should such a political force look like and what mold of candidate should Nigerians look to? We're glad to have joined us this morning on The Breakfast uh, to have a discussion on this, the presidential candidate uh, of the African Action Congress and the leader uh, of the Ticket Back Movement, also of Revolution Now, Omoye Leshore, is a guest this morning. I should say, Tiaroba, uh, political or presidential candidate, because um, that's right. Anika has just confirmed you um, <laughs> and your your colleagues. Um, welcome to the program. Thank you very sure. much for yes, bringing yes, me. Good morning. Yes. Um, um, how has it been for you? Uh, you know, since you you got out of jail. <laughs> wow. Um, <clears throat> well, I didn't really get out of jail because after I was released from the DSS detention, I was also sequestered in Abuja by a court order. What I mean is that a judge said I could not leave Abuja to any part of Nigeria. So for three years, I couldn't leave Abuja. I had to remain there until the Court of Appeal made a decision some few months ago that that decision was uh, too draconian and said I could leave and go to any part of Nigeria uh, as I wanted, but they still kept my passport. So I could leave Nigeria, but I could not travel out of Nigeria, uh, which is why I said I never really left detention. But if you think about Nigeria itself, uh, it's an open prison anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, was it a life-changing experience for you, uh, being in, in detention and also being you know, uh, limited to Abuja? Well, in a lot of ways, it's never happened even in the history of Nigeria, in recent history. The first time any Nigerian was uh, restricted to a city or town was uh, a labor leader, Pai Modu, uh, and it was during the colonial era. Uh, after independence, it happened to Chief Obafemi Aulo. He was uh, restricted to Lekki, here around here, I mean somewhere around here. Uh, because they also claimed that he was involved in treasonable felony. He was eventually sent to prison, Calabar. Uh, so I'm probably the third person in the history of Nigeria who was restricted to a city. So I was inside detention, and then I came out and I was in city detention. Never happened. So it would be, because it's historical in nature, of course it's life-changing, considering that I have not seen my family in the last uh, almost three and a half years now. You know, my younger brother was killed, uh, murdered on the, <clears throat> on the highway. I could not attend this barrier. So, so many things really, really happened. And after I was released from detention, I was uh, rearrested twice. Again, uh, you know, injuries were inflicted on my, they broke my nose bridge, a police officer. Another police officer shot me with a riot gun on the streets of Abuja, uh, on the tie. So, Pretty life-changing, yes. All right, let, let's get to the crux of the conversation. Yes. I mean, prior to uh, the elections that we're anticipating in 2023, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of talks about the third force, and uh, we've heard that there might just be a repetition of what happened in 2015, and so uh, it feels like a lot of Nigerians are anticipating, you know, something different away from the dominant political party. But it hasn't really, really, you know, been very... Uh, concrete, if you want to say, I'd like to ask you, do you think that this is a thought force as we approach the 2023? I, I refrain from using the word thought force okay. because um, to me it's like inferiority complex to say that you are a force in a third degree, whereas the people you want to replace who have already been abandoned and discarded by way of public opinion are then the dominant force. If they are dominant forces and then being a thought force just means that you want to uh, play along. I want to see us become the real force, because that's the conversation we're hearing on the street, is that people are tired of the two major big parties, or legacy parties, and they're tired of people who have been participants in the governance of Nigeria that put Nigeria where it is today, the precarious situation that Nigeria has found itself, and they don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. So 
Calling yourself a third force means there's this first force and the second force of which you are at the back. I'm not, you know, particularly impressed with that terminology. Okay, so, so let me bring you back again yes. now. Uh, being that you're not impressed with that, <laughs> do you think that there's a real force ahead of the 2020 yes, election? Yes, there is very, very serious uh, forces within the grassroots who want to see a different outcome in this election. And, it, it, and the outcome for them don't have anything to do with those who have been part of the despicable past, as uh, I like to refer to it. And you can feel it. You can feel it that everybody, and sometimes even the, you know, the energy might be misdirected, but you can see the energy that people don't want to have anything to do. They want a clean break from the past. And that is what is most important. That is why structures, I imagine, that have nothing to do with the structures you and the media are used to, which are structures are just people in various parts of the country doing everything they can. This time around, in some cases, using their own money. I am raising money from people. I, I came out of detention with no money, but people are donating through crowdfunding to my campaign. People who can afford to do that at a time of economic hardship are people who are desperate to see change. I mean, real political change, not you know, something that will put them back where they used to be in the last 22, 23 years now. All right. Uh, we, we have a lot going on. You know, this seems to be, like you've said, a sort of optimism that uh, uh, something can change. Yes. Time. I mean, you started it, you know, in 2019 with uh, your message of take Nigeria back or take it take back. Take it back, yeah. What kind of candidate um, should Nigerians look to? to salvage the situation in the country in a mode of uh, an alternative to the PDP and APC candidates? Yes. For me, my recommendations are very, very clear. Anyone who has been part of governance since 1999 in particular, if you've been governor, you've been vice president, uh, you've been a member of any of these political parties that we are all running away from, uh, should not be part of those under consideration, active consideration by citizens. People who have, we have to have a clean break from the past because we have to be careful at this time not to uh, run from frying pan to some serious uh, fire. And that's my recommendation that, you know, do it by way of elimination series. Don't have anything to do with anybody who cannot present a record that is clean and clear about their performance in the past. Uh, so that's, that's where we should start from. All right, there, there's this idea of, um, you know, as, as Nigerians would say, lesser evil. Um, uh, some of the view that you need to look at, okay, what's the best chance of kicking the PDP and the APC out? Let's look for the candidates or candidates who have a greater chance. And then these candidates are, may also be thinking, okay, can we pull some of the big names in court, big names, from these parties, the PDP and the APC, uh, to our side as a third force party, to be able to wrest power from them. That's the first thing. So we're looking at maybe lesser evil now. What do you think about this concept of the lesser evil as far as this uh, election is concerned? I have never met any evil that is less. Evil is evil. Um, I've never met a junior evil or a small evil. Never heard about them before. I've never heard of an apprentice evil before. Evil is evil. Nobody should go for the lesser evil, especially when the opportunity has presented itself for you to go with the angels. And it is the idea sold even to voters sometimes to say, look, yes, they're admitting that they are bad, but you see, you know, why don't you just look at one of us? Yes, he's bad, but he's not as bad as the rest of us. That is how we got here in 2015. You know, the concept of a lesser evil, a former general lesser evil, who has now established himself as the biggest evil to walk the face of this land. So why would anybody do that to themselves again? Especially when you have experience uh, at your doorstep to teach you that this, this is a mistake we've made in the past. And we should never repeat it, you know. And you know, when, as they say, that when history repeats itself, uh, it's always even a bigger tragedy.
Uh, but, but let's also talk about, you know, it's a good thing that you've mentioned the repeat of 2015. Yes. And we understand that in 2015, there was a conversation about the thought force. It wasn't maybe very prominent. Maybe it was this. 2019 you met. Yeah. 2015 wasn't, I didn't see thought force in 2015. So, so we're talking about, you know, the current government that, yeah. that took power yes. at the time. And we understood that there was a major Yes. You know, a measure of political ma parties, parties yes. uh, for us to have, you know, the yeah. APC now as a government. And a lot of people describe that as a thought force. And uh, I, I think that Nigerians have been waiting for, you know, the same pattern to have political parties come together and, you know, adopt a certain party or, you know, combination of several parties to form a government. Now, we know how Nigerians and a lot of persons were very, you know, strong on this current government and, you know, it was the way forward. It was the solution. It would solve all of the problems. Do you think that we might just also be at the verge of, you know, a repetition of 2015? Because if you look at the outcome, juxtaposing that with what was proposed at the time and what we're seeing now, you know, it's, it's nothing to write home about. What can we look out for? What should we do not to repeat the same mistakes? I mean, what to do is to look at some of the parameters that led us to 2015, you know, the hysteria, you know, the conjuring of facts, uh, lies actually being told, you know, and the biggest mistake perhaps that was made at that time was the lack of interest in investigating some of the things that were thrown at us, you know, when they said, oh, this person has these characteristics. People didn't even check. We didn't fact check. And most of the candidates at that time actually did not talk to Nigerian people. They didn't present any uh, uh, manifesto, manifestos. People were on their own presenting manifestos. And the part of the hysteria at that time was people saying, well, even if I catch him robbing a bank, I'll support him. If he doesn't have a certificate that he can present a NEPA bill, I'll support him. And here we are with the NEPA bill without light. You know, seven years later, <laughs> without electricity, uh, everything has been shut down. If you are seeing those patterns repeating themselves, as we are seeing in some cases now... But you supported you know, this government. No, it's not true. I, I've, you never? You're a journalist. You know, you can present. If I ever, you know, supported Buhari, people say that because they knew that I was diametrically opposed to the corruption that was going on at that time. And everybody could have taken my stories and ran with it. You know, people could swear by my stories in those days. I mean, when I was actively uh, uh, writing for Sahara Reporters, which I haven't done in like four years. And the same thing now that the political parties on the other side are doing with the APC government. They take Sahara Reporters stories and use it to say, hey, here comes the corruption, you know, you drove us away from. So we have been consistent on our side. But to say that I campaigned for Buhari, lie, or that I tweeted or asked anybody to vote for Buhari but, is but complete the, 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 falsehood. There's a, there's a video making rounds, you know, yeah. showing you, you know, uh, swarmed by APC supporters when the presidential election result was announced. Yes, because I was the first, Sarah Reporter was the first to announce all the results, even okay. when INEC was still battling with it. So I was returning from the International Conference Center in Abuja, ICC, and going to attend a press conference that Buhari was supposed to hold at his campaign headquarters. And when the young people there saw me, they yeah. came around and, you know, more people said, wow, this is Shore, the Star Report. Most people have never, up until that time, met me before. So I was the one who personally uploaded the video on my page, on YouTube, or Sarah TV. And they were saying change dole, you know, which is how I word for, you know, change by force. So there's, there was nothing to it other than that I found myself in the middle of these young people who were excited to see me, this great journalist in the country. I was similarly mobbed, but I didn't have the video. In Ghana, when I went to cover the Ghanaian election that produced the current president of Ghana, the first, his first time because nobody thought that he would win. And we were reporting because we were in a hotel with all these international uh, observers, and they had gotten the results. The Americans had gotten the results showing that this guy had won. So we broke the story. When we went to the headquarters of 
uh, the campaign of this particular candidate, uh, the current president of Ghana, and we introduced ourselves. We were equally mobbed. Like, how did you guys get the results uh, yeah, yeah. of the Ghanaian election? So, and I still get that even up to today. Most people recognize me for my work on Sahara Reporters than they even like treat me now as an activist. Because they always have a story that they refer to as one big breaking story or an investigative report that has something to do that changed their lives. Yeah. So that was what happened at that time. And they took it and ran with it, you know, you know, tweaked it and said, oh, I was jubilating. Even though I had a camera around my neck, I had a tag that enabled me to enter ICC where the election was being presented. So I never... Yeah, so so the, the tag on the yes. video. And, and, and PACT yes. was, was, uh, was almost a big deal in 2019. 19, yeah. And uh, not a few Nigerians hoped that would be some sort of force. Uh, it didn't work. I think yeah, you've, you've, you've talked about it several times. Yes. So we may not have to go into it. Uh, is there a possibility, looking at the mood you know, right now, as far as the 2023 uh, elections are concerned, is there a possibility that yourself, um, as candidate, presidential candidate of the AAC, will partner with uh, another um, alternative party? We say third was because they are too big, you know, like is it top four <laughs> in EPL. Uh, probably maybe the, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, who seems to be garnering a lot of attention, uh, so far, um, a lot of social media support. The young people think that um, he is the, the one to lead the country forward. Uh, are, you, are you willing to, to form an alliance with Peter Obi of the Labour Party in the next election? We are very different people. We are different ideologically. We are different in terms of conviction, history, uh, that it's impossible for me to abandon what my convictions are, what my beliefs are to form an alliance with someone who is part of the, the chip of, uh, of the old block. And if I am opposed to PDP and APC, I cannot then so you, jump into you, bed. You see OB as the chip of the old block? Of course. But a, lot of, a lot of people out there don't see him as, <laughs> they see him as somebody who, well, maybe people who was in the PDP and saw that there, were, there was a possibility that you have to part with money to get uh, the nomination, and he left. Where did you think they got the money for the nomination in 2019 with Atiku? They paid off delegates. So how did they get the money? Who shared the money? Are we pretending that that didn't happen? So it's why I cannot be deceived uh, to be part of such a, such a, such a, a, a movement, as, so as you, I call it. You can't it. be obedient. I've been disobedient my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but quickly, I mean, it, it's the same question, but, you know, in a different dimension. There, there are several uh, words out there. It's a good thing that we have you here, and we're asking yeah. you, do you have any plans to collapse your structure? No, no. You will never at any point in time. I, I might have people join a political party. A your, what about your structure? I'm talking about your structure. Are there plans yes. for you and the structure that you are with now? you know, to join other structures. I just said to you that it's not possible. It's a, this is a race that will run into the end. No the matter finish, the outcome. The finish line. All right. Mm. Yes. Uh, what, what, what kind of candidate are you? Um, what are you bringing to, to the table this time? Because we're looking at the mode of uh, uh, an alternative, uh, you know, presidential candidate in Nigeria should look to. For you as one of those who are outside the top two, or the big two, as, as it were, what, what kind of candidate will you be uh, presenting to Nigerians? Well, the cleanest break you can get from the past, this very torturous you know, past, is the best way to describe it. Uh, you have someone who's been consistently fighting for justice uh, for three decades. And like I used to tell people, I have scars to show for it. So you don't need to ask. You know, I have history, verifiable documented history, and I have also stated clearly, eloquently, what Nigeria needs, the solutions that we need to pull Nigeria out of the doldrums that we have been for since 62 years now. And there's no doubt that you don't have to look for it, what I represent. And for those who might have need to research, you can 
be clearly told that I'm the only candidate in Nigeria today with a website where I spelled out the, the policies and ideas. The, the rest I, of them don't have a website? Not that I know of. Oh. You know, some of them okay. don't even have manifestos. Uh, okay, I yes. would have said about, talk, talked about one, but yes. I think recently... Uh, so, you know, so you can find these ideas completely explained and broken down to the level of everybody. But most importantly, if you are looking for leaders with character in the next dispensation, with integrity, leaders with vision and mission-driven leadership, here you got one, all packed into one, because uh, this is what elections are about. What, what's this, the ideology? We are very socialist welfareists that the people of this country must own their resources and their wealth must be distributed to them. I don't want a Nigeria that continues on the part of what Oxfam said in 2015, an international NGO that five Nigerians are richer than 100 million Nigerians. And why is that? It's because only a few of our people have access to the wealth of the majority of the people. How are you going to address that? Would you, would you confiscate and redistribute wealth? No, it's not confiscation, it's investment in people. Okay. You know, we are at the point now where universities have been closed down for seven months. And the reason is simply because the priority of the government in power is not education. And if you invest heavily in education, you have redistributed well because it's the most powerful and clear-cut empowerment citizens can get. And that will redistribute wealth. But I must also state clearly that where it is clear that we need to nationalize companies that were taken away from Nigeria by Nigerians under shady deals, we will take those countries back. Because what we've discovered about all the privatization that has been done, most of it, 90% of it is that we privatize, sell at below market rate to these individuals, and we give them grants allowances. Yesterday, we had to give two companies or a few companies 16 trillion naira worth of tax rebates. And this is not the first time. You have, you have the biggest corporate welfare you know, policy probably in the world. But our citizens cannot afford to be given 1.2 trillion naira to reopen you know, public universities. You have an accountant general who could steal and take home 150 billion naira. But universities cannot get 200 billion naira of their first strands in this 1.2 billion naira arrangement that had been agreed upon, agreed upon since 2014. And you have 20 million of kids out of school. You have no hospitals in your country. You don't have infrastructure that is worth anything. So until that reinvestment is done in those areas, you cannot redistribute wealth. Redistribution of wealth is not only forcefully we, taking we over really, properties. Really it's out about of time. letting the citizens own what belongs to them. All right. All right. Uh, yes, I have a bite. All right. <laughs> I, I really would have to ask this, but in a few seconds. Yeah. I mean, there are several factors that we're looking out to shape, you know, the elections in 2023. Yes. And we've had issues of, you know, the beavers. It was said that the best thing that this government has done is the Electoral Act. And the introduction of the beavers, it would be impossible to rig. But it feels like we're hearing different reports at this point, and that's on the one hand. We've also seen that some citizens have actually sued INEC over the fact that 7 million persons have been unable to complete, you know, their voter registration. I'd like to share your thoughts on this and what you think uh, you know, this would mean for the elections in 2023. You know, I think we always make this mistake <clears throat> without verification of saying that one device will change the outcome of elections. It wasn't Beavers. I think there was another one before. Smart card reader. Smart card, yes. 2015. The finger uh, print reader. Did it work? It only worked for a few you know, months and then it became a liability. It is the credibility of these electoral officers that matters the most to me. And INEC right now is suffering from credibility. It's people you know, dominated by card carry members of a major political party in the country, the APC. I'm more worried about that than Beavers, because Beavers is going to be garbage in, garbage out. It is what is rigged that will still be uploaded to a server. 
you know, what is important is to have people with credibility. And this is going to take a lot more than just beavers. It's going to take real reorganizing and restructuring of our electoral body, INEC. But what we do between now and election is to stay on their case until we are guaranteed free and fair elections. All right, all right. Uh, I'm afraid that's uh, much time will afford us uh, on the program this morning with you. Uh, we should have more time probably talking about an hour with you. But hey, this is uh, the much you can take. Uh, Omo Elishore is the uh, presidential candidate of the African Action Congress. He's been a guest uh, on this first uh, discussion right here on The Breakfast on Plus TV. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much and, for uh, having me. Look, look forward to having you on set when campaigns start to kick off. Properly. I'll be back. All right, fantastic. Yes. All right, we have more discussions up next right here on The Breakfast. Well, we'll take a break, and when we return, we'll be right back with the conversations on The Breakfast. Please stay with us.